Venom computers. This is Intelligent Performance. Welcome to Intelligent Performance, where we are fanatical about excellence in human endeavor. And today we welcome Cameron Murray, an expert and a chief economist when it comes to all things the housing crisis. Cameron is an expert in looking at the numbers and going beyond the headlines. And today we talk about the quote unquote housing crisis. If you have not been sat under a rock, then you no doubt would have heard about the apparent housing crisis that we are currently finding ourselves in, about affordability issues, about how the housing prices are getting way out of control. Cameron's perspective is completely different, that maybe we're actually completely missing the point. We're in part of a political kind of smokes and mirrors campaign and one which has been going on for arguably centuries. Thank you so much for joining us. This is a great conversation. Let's dive straight in. Cameron, awesome to have you on the show. Thank you for being here and welcome. Where I'd love to start, as with everyone, is what's your take on intelligent performance? Uh, that's a tricky one. I'll give you my personal spin, which is also why I named my one-man think tank Fresh Economic Thinking. It's all about if you're, if you're intelligent about what you're doing, you can look at it from every angle. You can look at it back to front, upside down, left to right, and understand yeah. the problem fully. And if you can't do that, if it looks confusing when you look at it back to front, then maybe you haven't seen the complete thing. And so for an analyst or an economist like me, performance is all about making sure you've got a coherent view of what you're studying. And that means if you turn it around, turn it back to front, it still makes sense. Awesome. And I love that. And I think it's a great way to start given the topic we're going to be talking about is Australia's <laughs> favorite essay class. <laughs> um, That's right. <laughs> it's, it's served as well. Arguably, it supports too many of our retirees and supports the economic wealth of the country. And you're about to tell us why we've got it all wrong by the sounds of things. And <laughs> by Jack. So Give us the, what's your take on it, Cameron? Look, the book is called The Great Housing Hijack. Now, it doesn't mean that there's something wrong with our houses, although many people have complaints about the quality of uh, construction these days. Uh, the Great Housing Hijack is basically about the public debate or political conversation around housing and that we just can't seem to see it for what it is. As I said, turn it upside down and have a look and see if it still makes sense. Yeah, it's because it's vested interests on all sides, we have a debate that is designed to, to confuse more than enlighten about housing. And that's especially the case today where we have this affordability crisis, this beautiful headline that is interpreted in a hundred different and contradictory ways by different people, yeah. right? For your property developer, it's a crisis of rising construction costs and no buyers, right? For your landlord, it's a crisis of rising land tax and costs. For your renter, it's a crisis of rising rents. All these things contradict each other. So the great housing hijack is all about just getting things straight, just the economics of housing and the political economy of the debate. And after doing that, it's about looking abroad and looking at history and saying, have we ever done housing better? Have we kept more people happy? Have we had better and cheaper houses? Who's had it and how'd they do it? And could we do it again? And I think, yeah, after arguing about housing for a decade, at least, I've, this is my attempt to just set things straight and, and cut through the confusion. So what are people getting wrong with Ben Cameron? Because it sounds like whilst you, yeah, there's different perspectives on that topic. It sounds mm -hmm. like there's some congruency in terms of the message that mm -hmm. the price is becoming trickier for a lot of people. Um, That's the question. Is that what we're concerned about with housing? Is the price too high? The price is just the market value estimate of people trading these assets of what they're worth, the present value of the future sort of cash flows. So can that be wrong? Do we go, oh, the price of BHP shares is too high. We got a BHP unaffordability crisis. Like this is my question. And some people think, oh, the price is high, therefore bad, not the price is high. Therefore houses are good located near a lot of free public services. And so the price you're paying gets you a lot of good stuff, yeah. right? The price in Sydney are expensive because lots of rich people want to live in the best place in Sydney. That's, yeah. that's it, right? There's nothing 
physical here. There's nothing regulatory. It's just always the case. And so when people go, oh, the prices have gone up, we have to, there's a lot of steps before we make assumptions here. Like 67% of people are homeowners. For them, they just made free money, right? 18% of people are landlords. 18% of households are landlords and they own the 30 something percent of the private stock. That's great for them. All right. So are the prices too high for them? No, not really. They're happy. (laughs) Okay. So who are the prices too high for? First home buyers. Okay. So you go and buy a house when the price comes down. Do you want the price to keep going down? No, you want the price to go up just like all the other 67% of homeowners. So it's not clear that the price itself is a useful measure. And that's one of the areas where I try and lay out the fact that we don't talk about prices in other asset classes. We talk about yields and we talk about risk. Mm. Right? The yield, how much return you get on the price of market value of the asset, that is the price of an asset. Right? The cash sticker price is the result of those two things combined. And of course, that's why prices have gone up globally in the last few decades is because interest rates were very high in the 80s. Okay? So yields were very high, so the, the, the asset price was low. But of course, it was still very expensive to borrow money. People complain furiously about how expensive it was to get a mortgage and buy a house in the 80s. Yeah, even uh, though like prices 18, 19 percent, right, or something. Like yeah, that. it was in the teens for yeah. for quite a long time. The interest rate, right? And now it's five point something, right, or six percent. So you got you, you basically halve the cost of borrowing. So why shouldn't you pay twice as much for the house? So yeah, that's just one of the many questions that open up as well. How could we make the price lower? If it's too high, what's the right price? So like, think about it. You're an investor, right? If the asset price was halved, the yield would be twice as high and we'd be getting 10% passing yields on houses. Now, that's not an equilibrium. I'm an economist. You can't just have houses making 10% and all your other assets making 5% in the economy, plus any capital gains, right? Something's got to give. And so the price goes up. So it's it's a normal market outcome. And yet somehow we're observing it and imposing some kind of like culture policy debate onto what should be a totally sensible observation. Does that make sense? <laughs> or no? It makes sense, but I think it could be perhaps challenging. I guess maybe this is where I'm, I'm curious. So I'll disclose here, I own property, have multiple properties. And mm-hmm. you're right, I would definitely have enjoyed capital growth of the assets. And mm-hmm. there's a significant benefit to me in there. The affordability crisis, arguably though, especially as a political day, debate, sounds like it's more about optics and it's mm-hmm. about government who printed a lot of money during COVID to keep everyone um, being able to pay their mortgage and keep the country running. Because the worst thing, the thing we really, no one really wants is for the four largest companies in the country to fall over. And, and that's arguably maybe where do the banks come into this camera and they will come in and we'll come onto that, right? Yeah. But maybe the affordability context we're talking about right now is more of an optics piece that if the government did nothing or appeared to do nothing, then that wouldn't play well. What do you think? I think it's exactly that, right? Yeah. One, one way I've described it before is we've, there are all the political incentives are stacked in favor of pretending to make the market price either of rent or housing assets cheaper, but not doing it, right? You've got to talk the talk to the renters who are upset and do nothing and promise doing nothing to the 70% or so of people who are homeowners and landlords. Mm. You've got to promise them houses are a great asset. We're going to protect your asset. If prices fall, we're going to, we're going to bail out your mortgage with low interest rates, right? So you've got to do that. But if there's a bit of a rental price adjustment and there's some upset renters in marginal seats, then we're going to also promise them the opposite, right? And do nothing. It's just a game of signaling game, I call it, with no sort of material impact and no genuine political incentive to do something. And you know what's funny, though? You can go through the history books, and that's, and I did, and you can find exactly the same concerns for more than a century. In fact, if you read Charles Darwin's diary entry from January 1836, 
the biologist, father of evolution, sailed the HMS Beagle to Sydney. He wrote a diary and he's keeping track of all the animals he observes and everything. And the first paragraph on the first day in Sydney, what does he write? The number of houses just built is truly astonishing. Nevertheless, everyone complains about the difficulty in procuring a house or paying the rent. 1836, you know what the population of Sydney was? Less than 20,000, right? But I couldn't even fill a stadium. Yeah. No land shortage, no financial tricks, no tax issues. Hang on a minute. No one can afford a house except the sort of wealthy uh, aristocrats and the, the, the governor and his minions. Interesting. Maybe we are just experiencing normal property market outcomes. If you go to the 1880s, we had the one of the biggest land booms in Australia's history in Victoria. No one could afford houses. Interest rates went up. Guess what? Prices kept going up. This last phase of the boom. Same thing we're seeing now. In 1910, after the Federation, New South Wales had its first inquiry, its first parliamentary inquiry into the trouble of rising rents in Sydney. That's 114 years ago, right? Pre-tax issues, pre-zoning issues, pre, I don't know, uh, mum and dad landlords, whatever you think the problem is today. We, they had another inquiry in 1919, right? The federal government had the Piddington inquiry in 1919. And it went on and on. There's been inquiries year after year for a century. Since 2003, we had the Prime Minister's first homeowners task force. We had every state in the 2000s boom had some kind of inquiry. And I'm going on and on. And then in 2022, I think it was the Polinsky inquiry into housing supply and affordability. And I was an expert witness there. And that just rounds off the two <laughs> centuries of this political game of observing market outcomes seeing that some people are upset, jumping through those political motions, achieving nothing, the market corrects because markets go in cycles, yeah. waiting it out, next cycle, same thing again. And that's what we're observing. And you wouldn't believe me, but the average rent paid in Sydney today, in real terms, adjusted for inflation, is actually lower than it was in 2018 still. Wow. Nobody believes me, right? But you can go and Google search with the timestamp 20, 2016 to 2018 yeah. and look at rent crisis Sydney and you will see bunk beds and students stacked, yeah. tents in living rooms, same thing. And you will, you will not see the headlines very much that rents fell 2018, 2019, 2020, 2021 in Sydney in nominal terms. And there are a few headlines. I remember one said, Double whammy for landlords, rents crashing and prices crashing in 2018 mm. in Sydney. We forget that all of a sudden. Yeah. And of course, after things go down, they go up. And so now we just complain again. Okay, fine. I don't like rents going up as much as anyone, but you need to have a coherent view of what the market does to criticize it. You can't just say the market should be giving us this different outcome. But isn't now, the price key, should be lower. The key issue here, though, arguably, is that what we have, and you can correct me if this is the incorrect view, Cameron, is that mm. what we have done is we've turned housing, which is about providing shelter and accommodation to our population, into mm -hmm. an investment asset class, which has its complications, right? And arguably, when we start to think about housing our citizens, mm -hmm. and we worry about the yield, that mm -hmm. produces, and we think mm -hmm. about that like we might do BHP stocks, which is mm -hmm. a corporation mm -hmm. um, with shareholders requirement to deliver returns. Mm -hmm. There, whilst we might talk about that with similarities in terms of the language, arguably, if you're trying to get your housing stock to behave like a corporation does, then doesn't that it isn't that the crux of the issue in terms of you're trying to get it to do something which it shouldn't? Yeah, totally. It does. Yeah. As I say, one of the, one of the arguments I make is that the property title system, the property system is like a shareholding, right? Because you can actually own property as a share. So in New South Wales, there's things called company titles. So a building is owned by a company and you own a share of the company that comes with exclusive access rights to a particular geographic location of the property owned by the company. In fact, there are towns in South Africa that are owned buy a company and to buy real estate, you buy a share in the company, right? right? Yeah. The parallels are not just 
they are not just a good analogy. They are a specifically exact analogy. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Um, they are the same. They are literally the same and can be converted from one to the other. You can convert right. a property title to a shareholding of a company. And that's, I think, a really good point because we, yeah, as you say, we expect the market to do something it doesn't want to do. If, yeah. it, if, if this was called, I'm living in Brisbane, if this was called Queensland Property Incorporated, we own all the land and we build all the houses, you would expect prices to be high in the nice areas, right? You wouldn't expect everything to be cheap and affordable. But for some reason, we've tricked ourselves and gone, oh, no, but it's called property, not shares. Therefore, it must act differently somehow. Somehow the economics are different. But and and that's the big mistake. And so that's why I actually spent five chapters going through the economics of housing markets, where the asset price comes from, the rental price, the spatial distribution of rents and prices, the density distribution and the absorption rate, like how quickly you build new housing each year and just show these economic forces. Some would argue, though, that the fact that you've turned your housing market where you house your population and as i understand it we're only we're the only creature on the planet who pays for accommodation right we have to pay to live and pay to breathe effectively so if that's the case are, are there other models which maybe is the case for this housing affordability like this kind of inherent that what's happening is wrong i give them other models like in the netherlands as an example uh, yeah. i think renting is, is basically far more common than ownership as, as i understand it i'm, I'm getting yeah. what, at my comfort zone here yeah it's, it's more common in switzerland and lots of cities in germany as well that's true i guess the trick the, the reason you can make renting more common is you give renters many of the rights that are currently held by owners of property so the property owner can trade and they can allow access to anyone they want and charge for a price to sublet and so on. But if you give renters some of those rights, okay, and take them away from the landlord, of course, they get a proportion of the benefits of being a homeowner. I often, one of the arguments I make is that home ownership is the ultimate rent control because you pay a price today, it's fixed. And if the market changes in the future, unlike a renter who has to pay the market price when it goes up, you've actually got your rent controlled yeah. by paying up front. And you can get similar outcomes by creating rules for renters that prohibit the changes in rents under cer certain circumstances. You can certainly do that. You can certainly do that. And I talk about effective approaches to doing that. One way, for example, is to smooth off the rate at which you can increase rents. You basically have to take away the ability from the landlord to kick out tenants as if they're paying the rent and not you know, contravening any other part of the contract. So if they're complying with the contract, they're allowed to stay forever and there's a maximum rate at which you can put the rent up, which is common in many countries. I think in Switzerland, if you have a two-year lease, once you're there two years, you can stay forever. Wow. As long as you pay the rent and the rent can only be put up at a certain rate. And how would the landlords put up with something like that? They know it. They only buy it if they're willing to. They buy it if they want an asset like that on their balance sheet. Right. They don't buy it if they want to move in, move out, game the tax okay. system, et cetera, et cetera. They go, well, that's yours. But again, it's not that obvious because renters also are obliged to bring their own kitchen, for example, to an right. apartment. So you buy an apartment and it's basically got pipes sticking out of the wall in the kitchen and you've got to go to Ikea and bring it, right? So it's not, so what you're doing is you're, it's, you can imagine in Australia, landlords have all these rights, tenants have these, and then what you can do is change the balance a bit. But that comes with obligations for tenants as well in terms of maintenance and in terms of... And what happens to the kitchen? Do they leave the kitchen? Oh, they can take it to the next place. So they can leave it. And they're only a few thousand dollars from Ikea. And if you can stay for two years, that's only not much per week, right? Yeah. And I think also there's obligations to repaint the inside before you leave the property, oh. stuff like that. Interesting. Okay. So it's not, it's just a different, it's just a different balance of who's got what rights. And of course, rents would be cheaper if you had to bring your own kitchen to every place in Australia too, right? <laughs> and and if you had to repaint it as you like. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, we can, you can do stuff like that. But of course, in Germany, there's similar rules and they're all complaining about rising rents now too, right. expensive houses, especially in the cities. 
So what you're saying, Cameron, is that basically there is no problem. And you let me know if I'm paraphrasing this correctly. There is no problem. <laughs> it's always been like this. <laughs> People like to whinge. Politicians are trying to pretend to fix it but not fix it because it's counterintuitive to fix it because it would eat into some of the existing constituencies and they're trying to appease other constituencies. And if they stayed silent, then they would look like they were doing nothing. So they just talk about something and then just do nothing. That's mostly right. And I guess I would say it's normal market outcomes, but I'm not saying it's a desirable outcome. Okay. So which bit? Right. So to say yeah. that it's a normal thing is not to say we can't improve on it, right? right. So pre-public health care, we could say, well, it's a normal thing if you're old and sick to die on the street. It's always been like that. And politicians promise to do something, but they don't because it means taxing their allies. And I could say all the same stuff then and say, this is not, we need to understand this is not a new thing. It has always been like that. We need to think about a system change if we want a different outcome. Okay. People are going to be poor all the time. So what do we do? We change the system to just give them money. If they're sick, we change the system to give them health care. And what we actually did in the mid 20th century is an anomaly here. And I think this feeds into how we have a, our debate. We think the market's getting worse, but actually, if you zoom out and look long term, the market was bad, very unequal. Home ownership was 40% in Australia's cities prior to the Second World War. It's still nearly 70% today, 664 or so. And then after the Second World War, Australia and many other countries decided, okay, it's time for system change in housing. We cannot have the slums and the poverty that we had before for the working class when we've just sent them to war. We can't bring them back to that condition. We must have a um, nation building effort here. And so pretty much every country massively upgraded the quality of houses, massively redistributed houses, gave, essentially just gave land for free to, to soldiers and cheap houses and cheap mortgages. And that's how we did it. And what we're seeing is the slow return to normal as we've decided we got good outcomes from doing that, then we stopped. Now we're like public housing, no, only the very poorest 5,000 people can get that. Yeah. Where it used to be anyone, right? And so a lot of countries where we're turning to this normal market outcome and we're misunderstanding, we, we think it's a problem with the market, which is backwards. No, this is exactly what markets do. The problem is that we don't, we're not creating alternatives to the market like we used to. And so we've got more and more, more and more people in private rental and they're more exposed to these market fluctuations just as they were in the 1930s and the 1920s and all through the 1800s. And so for me, if you want to navigate the politics, keep the 67% of homeowners happy and the 18% of landlords, you need to think about We've got 33% of people who are renters who are subject to these market conditions and buying at the market price. We need an option for about half of them who really get squeezed all the time where they're not exposed to the market that may not involve buying at the market price. And so you basically just subsidize housing in some way or form or way. And my preferred way is a sort of parallel public home ownership system. So just like we have public hospitals and private hospitals and public schools and private schools, and we have public free roads and we have toll, private toll roads. We go, if you can't rent in the private market or you don't want to buy there and you're mm. a resident and you can come and buy at a discount from us and we'll just supply you. But it's not a freebie. You can only sell it to someone else who also qualifies to buy a discounted property. Right? So it's not like, Here's a million dollar apartment in Sydney and I'm giving it to you for 350,000. It might be that, but you can't turn around and sell it to a million. You can only sell it to someone else who can access that discounted apartment. This... So you create this sort of alternative option and renters can then leave the rental market and go to it and homeowners can leave the home ownership market, but there's no direct manipulation of the price through taxes or anything like so that. So there's a, I see it just a secondary market, a second option, basically. Like instead yeah. of shipping at Woolworths, uh, you can go tops. Correct. This, as I understand it, is what Dan Andrews was starting to, or became 
hit the headlines for down in Victoria, right? Social housing piece. Forgive me, Cameron, if that's not yeah. my understanding of it, it is average at best. Yeah. But it was the idea of pulling down social housing to replace it with new social housing. The challenge with that is that the kind of the actual the net figure of how many new homes was marginal. I think it was like yeah, yeah. the hundred something like it was very very small given the effort. Is that the type of mechanism you're thinking about or that you could see could work? Yeah, look, I'm a bit wary of this knocking down and rebuilding to get the same amount of dwellings. Now, the details matter on that. I'm not going to say it's wrong because old buildings are more expensive. And all my builder mates say, just knock your house down and rebuild. It's cheaper than renovating. Yeah. Right? So I, I'm an economist. I want the efficient way to do things. Right? <laughs> so I'm not saying that's an inefficient way to get 300 extra dwellings. But yes, some kind of public operator. Now, it doesn't have to actually... Manage it, it can just take tenders from private developers with large estates and go on this street. If you guys pay up front, you can have 15% off the market price and you can put these dwellings in your pool of things to sell, right? There's a lot of ways to do this, but yes, it would in essentially involve acquiring sites and building homes or just directly acquiring homes and putting them into this pool, which over time would grow to about I'm, th I'm thinking 10% of the housing stock, which is about an, a million, one and a half million, if you could grow it to that over 10 years. And is that then you'd have 67% of people homeowners, you have 10 or 12% in this alternative system, and then you'd have about. And that's a, politically speaking, that's a very powerful way to appease everyone. I think it navigates the problem because you're not in the business of crashing everyone's, yeah. the value of everyone's biggest asset. Which you don't. Right? Yeah. You know? You're not upsetting landlords by heavily intervening in the rental market and turning Australia into a Switzerland where tenants have to bring their kitchen, but <laughs> can't get rid of them for 25 years. Yeah. Okay. Maybe there are improvements on those fronts and yeah, maybe there's better taxes here and maybe there's better protections for smoothing out rent here, but they're very politically sensitive. However, people don't get upset when the government builds roads and schools and hospitals. They really don't. And they're very expensive. Yeah. <laughs> And I think the other trick is to make this universal. And uh, the, the system I propose, I called it housemate, because in Australia, it's got to be job seeker, Medicare, housemate, typical Australian policy. Catchy, catchy slogan, yeah, I'm with you. And I basically use the example of Singapore to show the sort of extreme effective case. Right. So I'm not sure if you're aware, but in Singapore, it became independent in 1965 and Housing was one of their big issues. Lee Kuan Yew started the Housing Development Board and home ownership was about 20% in Singapore. Yeah. By the end of the 1980s, home ownership was 88%. They essentially rebuilt the city just like you would rebuild the roads and all the public buildings and stuff, but they rebuilt with the houses as well and radically change the face of Singapore. Now it's not, it's true that Singapore's private rental market is very expensive and the landlords, there are very happy, but every citizen, it's universal, has access to buying an HDB home off the plan, like you would any other developer or in the secondhand HDB market, which is in parallels because those owners can only sell to other qualifying buyers who don't own other property and a residence. And this, of course, issues there's a course it's going to be there's going to be dodgy deals for buying land for the government just like there is when you buy land for the olympic venues and you overpay for your mate's racetrack or whatever there's, it's going to be difficult but when you entrench the system i think and once there's this acceptance that it's universal my kids could get it if they wanted then you don't have this sort of culture class oh why should we give poor people free houses hey if you want one you can go get one too it's just a yeah. discounted house. So I think that's, yeah, that's what's worked. If we look historically, we tried that after the first world war, we had that soldier housing and we did that and we housed heaps of soldiers and got a big spike in home ownership rates. Uh, there were controversies then of politicians overpaying for their mates property to build houses in the city and, and using their friends as the builder and all that sort of stuff. I think we can do better than that today. And I'm not saying we wouldn't have those issues, but if you want people to have a cheap housing option, I just think do it directly. Mm. This whole indirect manipulate everyone's asset price with different taxes, 
the first uh, home bar would be an example of that, right? Pardon me? The first home buyer's grant would be an example. Like make make thirty thousand dollars available. Guess what? That house now is thirty thousand dollars more than it probably should be. Yeah, look, I'm not super against those grants. I just think that then don't work in the long run because you can only bring forward people who are ready to buy. And then after everyone's used the grid, there's this shadow, this hangover period of people who've brought their buying forward and there's no one else lined up who's that could buy with the 30,000. Yeah. And then you get rid of the grant and you do it again. I just don't, I just don't think it's a thing that the majority of its effect is essentially change when a small sliver of first home buyers who are ready to buy this year or next buy their house. And in doing so, you create a little bit of price bump as well. And I don't think the price bump lasts, but it's not like a sustained ongoing thing. We've had first home owners grants since the 80s. We have them every cycle in some form. Now we've got the shared equity schemes coming. And I'm not even against those either. Help some of them with shared equity mean? What's that model? That's essentially where the st I, th I think each state, Queensland, New South Wales, and Victoria all have a shared equity program. Essentially, if you're a first time buyer, you can go and buy your house. The government will pay you 20% of the value to buy the equity of 20% equity stake. And you only have to stump up 80% of the market price. Which is and, typically. And when you sell it, you've got to pay 20% of your sale price back. Right. All right. Now, isn't yeah, that I, effectively what you're talking about? Yeah, I guess for me, it's just a different accounting for where the equity lives. That's the housemate, isn't it? Yeah, you would say the housemate, the equity is just collectively owned all the time because every time you resell it, you're retaining that equity. Yeah. You know? And you could account for that. You could come up with some kind of corporate structure or trust. The National Housing Trust owns equity in 10 million homes, but we never sell it. You know, you could do that. So that's why I don't have a huge problem with the equity share. I just do wonder what happens because you can access the whole market with it. We have, what, 100,000 first home buyers a year. In 10 years, you have 20%, you know, 200,000 times a million, $200 billion of equity in people's houses. Maybe that's fine. Maybe that's a, a, a simpler administrative model. I don't know, but are we prepared for that? I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll take anything. I want to turn to the banks. So you talked yeah. about vested interest. You talked about who wins from this kind of bubbling cauldron of crisis. What, what's it sounds like the banks, given they they make significant. Mm. Cash all gains from lending to this asset class. It's, <laughs> so what's their role in all of this? The banks? Oh, look, I think the way I see banks and property have always been intertwined, right? Lending secured against property is the heart of banking. <laughs> <laughs> and it has been for hundreds of years. It's, it's not a new thing. I guess I don't, I don't see it as a huge problem in that Banks are profitable and haven't crashed and property goes up in value with the growth of the economy. I think the trick here is the political tension arises because the ownership of the banks is heavily skewed to the top, right? If we, if each citizen had a one twenty-six millionth share of the Commonwealth Bank yeah. or, and every bank, wouldn't matter. Banks are roaring. We're all happy. Banks are crashing. We're all upset, but we're in it together. Yeah. Who cares? And it's the same with property. If we had 100% home ownership. Or, owls or similar, right? That's right. If we had 100% home ownership and if we all had equal shares of coals, these wouldn't be huge issues. And I think yeah. the tension arises because the mm. disproportionate ownership of banks and property historically, like many assets, because it's not a competitive and dynamic industry like I, what we used to think space was a lazy industry, but in America, it's apparently very competitive all of a sudden. Yeah. But banking and property, it's just not a place where it's easy to compete and change. And so the same sort of winners just get drawn over time. Whereas in other sectors of the economy, I think the fact that there's a winner doesn't really have as much of that what sort of class animosity because you can always go start a construction company or become a plumber and run your own business and, and make a good living. Mm. No one cares that plumbers are doing well because everyone could be a plumber if they wanted. 
but we can't all be banks and property owners. We can't be property owners unless we buy off someone who already owns property, right? Because that company, that property, Queensland Incorporated already exists. So yeah, I guess I don't see, there's a big conversation in academia about financialization. You've probably heard about. No, I'm not. Oh, so a lot of academics say the problem with housing is we treat it as an asset. And I go, yeah, it's an asset. So the question is now what? Do you want to regulate lending? Because we used to in the 1960s have very strict rules on, on bank lending for mortgages. And the problems we had then were single people can't buy houses because banks only lend to couples because we were really strict with what they can do. Okay. We solved that. We let them freely lend to anyone. And now we're complaining about that. So however you regulate that, you're going to end up picking winners and losers. And maybe that's fine. I don't have a huge issue with it, but it's not what regulating lending is not what created big changes historically in terms of getting into housing or affordable housing. So my key takeaway here, Cameron, is really, even the way you're talking about it, there is no problem is effectively what you're saying. I would say the problem we have is that Property markets are doing their normal thing and, and, <laughs> we're, and we are expecting something different. So effectively then there is no problem right. other than an expectation difference. Correct. correct, correct. The problem is we're <laughs> expecting markets to do something different. Markets are not doing something different. They're doing what they did <laughs> last cycle and cycle before. Yeah. That's a good way to put it. I, I, I don't obviously put it like that. I, I have, but yeah, that's a neat way to sum, summarize it. And it's really funny because. Well, I'll tell you a story. I was talking to a journalist and in 2021, maybe during COVID, just when the home buying was really ripping, right? I think at the end of 2021. And he said, I'm doing an article, a story about the trouble first home buyers are having in the market, the competition for buying. Really? I said, oh, okay, that's interesting. The latest data shows we've got record first home buying. First home buying has never been higher than it is now. And you want to do a story that it's the worst time to be a first home buyer. Yeah. Pick one. So they did the story and they didn't tell the audience that first home buyers was, were at record highs. And the reason the auctions were busy is because they were full of first home buyers. And so for everyone who missed out on the auction that they talked to, there was a first home buyer who won that house. It was like something like 200,000 first home buyers that year compared to less than a hundred thousand per year in the five years prior. Wow. Yeah. So it's a, the graph just is spike like this, right? Because interest rates got low. It became cheaper to rent money than rent a house. Yeah. So the first, what do you do? That's what markets do, right? That's what I remember earlier. I said the price just can't come down with a high yield, right? If interest rates are 5%, you can't just have assets sitting around yielding 10%, safe, secure housing assets. So people just leverage at 5% bid the price up. Yeah. And that's what happened. And yeah, I guess that's an example of what you're saying is that the problem is in our minds more than in the market. What about the broader inflationary environment now where if your food costs 300 bucks a week, where it used to cost <laughs> 150 bucks a week, maybe it's hard yeah. to play your carrots, but they're more expensive, but it's easier to, now your mortgage feels like a bigger lump and that's also grown as well, perhaps, but it hasn't grown at 50% or hundred percent like the carrots or something similar, right? Is um, that arguably more systematic? Are we wrongly labeling that housing crisis? Oh, what do you mean? For ri rising interest rates causing the housing no, well, I mean, it's just that we're, we're seeing inflation and we're calling it a housing crisis. Like the pay, right? So if you see, so your interest rates mm. are Six, uh, gone from three percent to let's say six percent. So they, yeah. so the cost of money is doubled effectively, but from a low. <laughs> but it feels like, whereas my carrots and my, my food now, that's actually doubled in price, even though CPI or the other adjusted versions of that, yeah, are like nine percent. But actually, if you really look at it, when cucumbers go from a dollar to two dollars, that's not six. Well, that's not ten percent. That's hundred percent. Yeah. Right. So, are we mislabeling? Or because we're not that smart, we don't really know, or we're just getting um, told by the media. What, what, and it's actually the housing crisis because it's a great thing to talk about. Do you think that's a contributing factor? Yeah, I'd say, I would say we are calling just the inflationary pulse a housing crisis for sure. Right. Um, there's a couple of things I want to pick up on on what you said. 
Uh, firstly, carrots haven't gone up by double. Um, fruit and veg goes up and down all the time. Uh, I, I have people swear black and blue to me on on Twitter every day. <laughs> Inflation is 10 times higher than what they say. I fill up my car all the time. And I'm like, I fill up my car all the time. And not only that, I go to the ASIC website that tracks the petrol price at every Bowser in the country every week and has done for 20 years. And I actually remember pre-COVID petrol being $1.80. And I, I remember being a dollar seventy fifteen years ago or something, and it's still a dollar eighty, right? It's definitely not a lot of the way you know, I have this debate with because you, you know the facts very tight, which is great. Yeah, and this is the same thing about rents in Sydney. People keep telling me, "What do you know about rents in Sydney?" I'm like, the ABS has access to four hundred and forty four four hundred and forty thousand rental managed rental properties across Australia, and they know the price of every single one. <laughs> and they tell me this, and you just forgot the prices fell for five years. You just wow. forgot it. So, so first point, carrots aren't twice expensive. Inflation cumulatively since COVID is like 20, 21%, 23%, something like that, right? And a lot of that is insurance. A lot of that is rent. The, at the moment, sorry, that's just to be clear, that's the cumulative figure since 2020. So yeah, roughly speaking. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we're talking about the CPI, which would be about... Seven, seven percent per year or something like that. Yeah, it spiked at around seven percent for a year and a half, two years. But yeah, obviously, I had to get up to that, and it's coming down from that. Um, and yeah, a lot of that is airline flights and things, and they're coming down as well. The biggest things in the CPI are, are rental housing, transport, and food, right? And most of them are coming down a bit now. So CPI. But the other thing people often will tell me, if the price of other things is going up. Doesn't that mean we should pay less for rent because we're getting squeezed by all these other things? Mm. So therefore, that means that the crisis is even worse. Because if all your other costs have gone up 20% in three years, then your rent's gone up 30%. That's even worse. Okay, But that's actually a slight misunderstanding of the economics here, right? Because if the other cost of other consumer goods goes up 20%, it actually makes you willing to pay more for your rent because to pay the extra $100 rent per week, you're giving up fewer other consumer items. Interesting. For example, if carrots were a dollar a kilo. Is what you're saying, right? Yeah. And I wanted to pay $100 a week extra rent. I got to give up 100 kilos of carrots to move to that better place. But if carrots are now $2, which they're not, I only have to give up 50 bags, 50 kilos of carrots to move yeah. to that. So it's actually, in terms of the opportunity cost, right? Yeah. In economic yeah. terms, it actually decreases what we have to give up to go and move to a better place or bid higher for the rent. And that's why rents track with overall inflation in the economy. So they have to do it. The inflation in other things goes up. Your rent doesn't go down, it goes up with it because of these forces, because we're giving up less of other stuff or I'll pay more rent and move to a better place. So you're... Arguably, the rent's been better value for the last few years, and now it's just catching up, is what you're saying? Basically, yeah, it's catching up um, to where it was eight years ago in Sydney and Melbourne. And I think we've also, there's a lot of nitpicky economics to clarify. I'll give you another example, all right? A lot of people look at the wage price index and go, look, the wage price index is rising by this, but inflation's this, or rents are doing this. The wage price index is an index that measures the price you would pay for the same person to do the same job each year, right? Same hours, right? So it's, a, it's like, how much does the, the wage for doing the same thing go up? But what's happened during COVID is we've had a massive compositional change of what types of jobs people do, right? So if... The wages are the same, but now we don't have as many waiters at the restaurants because we've all got QR codes. There's fewer of those low-wage people and more of the high-wage people. So across the economy, wages are actually higher. Secondly, the number of work hours and people working has massively increased. And thirdly, the no amount of income that what we call independent contractors or self-employed people has massively rocketed. It was up something like 15% in one year in 2021, nominally. So that's your plumbers and your electricians and all those guys that work for themselves, small businesses. Their incomes went up 15%. So the wage price index was going up like 3%, but people moved to better jobs. 
self-employed people made heaps more money. Everyone got given money from the government. So household income collectively was massively higher. And everyone's wages are only going up 3%, but rents are going up 10%. I'm like, yeah, because household incomes went up 23% or 24%. Wow. Right, everyone's just loaded with money right now, and you're looking at this one price index of this thing that is not related to how much money people can spend as a household. So that's just another one of those <laughs> things that just circulates around the media. Love this. That just needs to be understood to make sense of what's happening. Because if it was true that household incomes were only rising at three percent, like the wage price index, when the rents wouldn't go up twenty percent. How, who would be paying this? Where would the money come from? Yeah. There's no magic pudding of money that people can just spend more on rent because the market's bad. There are forces at play. Anyway, Cameron, that's my rant on that. Leave it there. That is <laughs> a fascinating discussion. Thank you so much. And I love your whole approach typifies fundamentally what we're about. We, we want to challenge what people are thinking, providing them with new ways to look at it. Uh, your book is called The Great Housing Hijack. It's available from uh, next week. So we're recording this on the 23rd of February. So I think something like it's on the 27th, 28th. 27th. 27th. Yep. That's the, you've got some book launches uh, happening. So yeah, if you uh, want to meet Cameron in person, make sure you Google his name. I will link to uh, your website and your consulting business in the episode. But Cameron, thank you for convincing me that we have no problem. <laughs> and it's all in our head. That's a beautiful <laughs> <laughs> it's great to chat, Michael. Venom Computers. This is intelligent performance.